Zero. Okay. Looks like I'm back on. Sorry about that. If you uh, left off with us in Ezekiel chapter 29, uh, you can pick up at verse 11 because that's where we left when our live stream froze on Facebook. So the text goes on to talk about the fact that God is going to uh, scatter the Egyptians. He's going to scatter them amongst the nations. They're going to be brought back after 40 years, but they're going to be brought back to be a much more humble nation. They're not going to have their former glory of pyramid buildings and all the rest of the glory. They'll, and then it says in verse 16 at the end, then they will know that I am the Lord God. And at the last verse of that chapter, it says, then they will know that I am the Lord God. But it says how he's going to destroy them through Nebuchadnezzar in verse 18. So if you're in verse chapter 29 and verse 18, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. And we read about that last week, how he destroyed Tyre. But he never got paid for it. So the text says that Yahweh the Lord is going to pay Nebuchadnezzar for his hard labor, uh, working so hard to punish Tyre on the Lord's behalf, and that he's going to give him the plunder and property of Egypt, and they'll carry off all of their wealth. And then it says in verse 19, this will be the wages for his army and his payment, verse 20, because they work for me. And then the exiles from um, Jerusalem and Judah are there in Babylon already, and they're wondering, what, what's this got to do with us? He says, he will cause a horn to spread Israel, and I will open your lips among them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So there's a promise for Ezekiel to be able to speak more freely of the word of the Lord, and also for a power or for Israel to also have some representative. And uh, this could be political. It could be the influence, the godly influence of Daniel in the capital city of Babylon. Now we're in chapter 30, and you'll see it starts with no date. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and thus say, and say, thus says the Lord. And again, we're talking about a judgment on Egypt. In verse four, it says, a sword will come against Egypt. But you know, when I look at verse one of this chapter 30, it just reminds me of Jesus. Look at this, it says, the word of the Lord came to me. Do you ever think about that in a Christmas context? You know, we have four different gospel accounts of the incarnation of Christ, but in John's gospel, he mentioned in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes on to say in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of the Lord came to me. Well, we don't know this is maybe not the Logos of God. It's that God's communication through Ezekiel to the nations. But still, the word of God is coming to us tonight as we listen to the book of Ezekiel and prophesy to people. If you know Jesus and you tell people about Jesus, you're giving them a prophetic word because everybody needs Jesus. Well, passage, as I said, in verse 4, again mentions the sword is going to come against Egypt and against Cush and other surrounding nations, put Lud. And verse 6 says, all who, su uh, who support Egypt shall fall. And again, that expression from Migdor to Syene, uh, from Seattle to um, Orlando, Florida, declares the Lord, and they are going to be in trouble. And in verse 8, again, this emphasis, then they will know that I am the Lord. Have you ever thought about that? Even in the midst of God's strange work, his judgment, he's doing it so that people will turn to him and know him personally and realize that idols aren't making it. Not materialism, not popularity, not prestige, not power, um, not pagan symbols in Egypt, but he alone is the Lord. And verse 8 says, I'm going to set fire to Egypt. Do you see that in the text there in verse 8? If you miss it there, it also comes out again in verse 16. And I will set fire to Egypt. Um, Egypt's doom is coming according to this chapter in verse 9, the last part of the verse. The day of Egypt's doom is coming. And verse 10, I'm going to put the wealth of Egypt in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, as I've already mentioned. But look at verse 12, the last part of it, and the first part of verse 13. 
I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Thus says the Lord God, I will destroy idols. God does not like idols. They dehumanize us. Uh, they do not accentuate the image of God. They do not bring out human dignity. They do not bring out God's rightful praise and the flourishing he wants us to have by having a relationship with him, even in suffering. The truth is always better than lies and deceit. So where will the judgment fall? Well, we already know it's going to come by Nebuchadnezzar in verse 10, but where? Well, verse 13 mentions some of the specific geography on Memphis, and then verse 14 on Pathros, on Zon, and on Thebes in verse 15. They'll set a fire. Pelusium will be in great agony. Um, and it goes on to talk about other cities. Now, verse 19, the chapter, the mid chapter ends with, he will execute judgment on Egypt and they will know that I am the Lord. Well, that's um, pretty wild. But you know, really, when you consider this prophecy by Ezekiel, if you were back there and you could put yourself in Ezekiel's shoes and the shoes of, or the sandals of the exiles, and they're listening to this prophecy, this is pretty audacious stuff. And I use the word um, on purpose. To say that a kingdom, Egypt, that has been in existence for over 2,000 years at this time, and has built mighty pyramids, and it, that the whole thing is going to burn? I mean, that's, that's what, be defeated by a country, yeah, maybe you know, some skirmishes, but the whole country is going to be burned and they're going to be exiled for 40 years? This is amazing. Uh, but um, if you look ahead later on, he's going to come back to some of these themes of the fire and how it actually blots out the, the moon and the stars and the sun uh, because Egypt is on fire and how the nations around look at this thing and are strongly affected by it. But uh, yeah, the point is, the how is known, it's going to be by fire and the sword and by Nebuchadnezzar. The where is known, the geography, the reason, the idols, that's the negative side. They're going after idols. The positive side of verse 19, Yahweh wants to be known by Egyptians. Now, <clears throat> In verse 20, it talks about uh, going on, and, and this one again is dated, this prophecy is dated when the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel saying, Son of Man, you'll remember Son of Man is one of the favorite titles that Jesus used for himself. I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he's, it's not going to get bound up, it's not going to be put in a sling, won't be strong enough to hold a sword. And then it goes on in verse 22 to say, I'm going to break his other arm as well. And, and then in verse 25, I'm going to give strength to the arm of the king of Babylon. So again, this is, this is poetic license, but it's also literal. These things are going to happen. They're going to be fulfilled. Babylon is going to conquer Egypt, and they did, did so. Um, in chapter 31, again, another prophecy, and this one is dated again of when the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And verse 2, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his multitude, Whom are you like in your greatness? Apparently, uh, the, the Pharaoh has got word that Ezekiel is making these prophecies, and he's saying, <laughs> Who can compare to us in all of our greatness? And uh, look, our, if you compare Egypt as a tree to other nations, Ours is the tallest tree. Uh, we're the big kahuna. We are the, the big man on campus. We are, we're the power people. And in verse 19, I made it beautiful. The, uh, the Egyptians are very much boastful. Um, even Eden, the garden of God, uh, was as beautiful as, as Egypt. Well, this, this prideful boasting reminds you of Satan behind the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, and Satan, uh, Lucifer, behind the king of Tyre in um, Ezekiel chapter 28. Pride is a very bad sin. And the interesting thing about it is, it's not something that you, you don't tattoo it on your head, you don't pierce your body, you don't wear it with an obscene shirt. You can actually have pride in your own spirit, in your own heart, but it's a very 
disgusting sin. Look at verse 10, how the Lord describes it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it towered high and set its tops, let's talk about the tree metaphor again, and its heart was proud of its height, I will give it into the hand of a mighty one among the nations. Verse 12, foreigners and ruthless nations will cut it down and uh, let it go. And verse 15 says, the Lord God on that day, this big cedar tree is going to go down to Sheol. Sheol is a, a word for the place of the dead. Jesus describes Sheol as having, uh, before his resurrection, now it's heaven or hell, but in uh, Jesus' description, the place of the dead had two compartments. <laughs> One was where the rich man went, uh, which was in Abraham's bosom, and the other was where Lazarus, uh, excuse me, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom into a place of comfort in the place of the dead, and the rich man who didn't give a hoot about the poor man at his gate, he goes to a place of torments, also at the place of the dead, Sheol. Well, this passage just says, the Old Testament understanding of life after death, they are going to go to Sheol. They're going to go down. Last week I made a joke about that. A child in one of Kim's classes years ago used to tell his playmates when they misbehaved on the playground, you want to go down there? You want to go down? You're going to go down there. And it was kind of his way of talking about hell without using the word hell. But um, this passage is talking about going down there in much the same way. And... Uh, Pharaoh and his multitudes are going to go down. We already know they went down earlier in the, in the Torah when Egypt was, uh, Israel was brought out of Egypt and Pharaoh and his armies chased them and got drowned in the Red Sea. Um, but now we have Egypt later on in history and they are misbehaving again. And in chapter 32, again, we have a prophecy with a date on it, Ezekiel prophesying against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. See why we can do kind of a highlights here? And just talk about Egypt, because like three or four chapters here are all talking about Egypt. This one now, um, Ezekiel's supposed to make up a, a little dirge, uh, sing a little song about what's going on here with Egypt. And he talks to the Pharaoh again, um, not Oprah, Hophra. And he says, you considered yourself a lion of the nations, but you are like a dragon in the seas. You see that in verse 2? A dragon in the seas. Pharaoh is describing himself as a great big sea monster. He made the Nile, and he's the big ruling monster in the Nile, and everybody is afraid of him. You burst the rivers, you trouble the waters with your feet. And uh, Verse 3, thus says the Lord God, I will throw my net over you with the host of many peoples, and they will haul you up in my dragnet, and they will cast you to the ground in an open field, I will fling you, and I'll cause all the birds of the heaven to settle on you. It's a repeat of an earlier prophecy, but he's getting it at a different times. So I don't know, sometimes if you're like me and you need to be rebuked about pride, or you need to be warned about judgment to come, sometimes it takes more than one warning. And so this is happening again, and it's the same metaphor, used again. But now we're talking about um, in verse 7, when I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and I will make the stars dark and I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light and the bright stars of heaven I will make dark over you and I will put darkness over your land, declares the Lord. Well, we know we, the Lord did that once before in Egypt's history in one of the plagues um, that Moses warned them about. In fact, it was the last plague that allowed Israel to come out because Pharaoh couldn't take anymore. But in this particular context, I think based on the previous chapter where the Lord says twice he's going to set the whole country on fire and it's going to be desolate for 40 years, that's a lot of geography. That's a lot of smoke. And uh, it's going to block. We aren't going to be able to see the stars. In fact, look what happens to the surrounding nations in verse 9 or in chapter 32 of Ezekiel, verse 9. I will trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries that you have not known. I will make many peoples appalled at you, and the hair on the kings will bristle with horror because of you. 
So surrounding powerful nations and their kings and the big shot political people, when they see what's happened to Egypt, their hair's going to stand up on the back of their head and they're going to be horrified by it. When I brandish my sword, see God is seeing himself as a cause of this behind Nebuchadnezzar. They shall tremble every moment, every one for his life on the day of your downfall, Ezekiel. I don't know this poem by heart, but I'm sure many of you have heard it before. But apparently in uh, medieval times, there were a lot of different bells. There were bells for fires, call people out to the pale brigade. There were wedding bells, church bells, but there were also funeral bells. And because people died a lot and uh, at younger ages and they didn't have penicillin and so forth, that funeral bell would be ringing a lot. And the old poem says something like this, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for me, or it tolls for thee, it tolls for you and me. The poem says something like each man's death, each man or woman's death diminishes me because we realize that we are mortal. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord according to Romans chapter 6, the last verse. But here the, we see that people, when they see people's mortality, it allows them to think, oh my goodness, there goes me, but for the grace of God, or maybe for timing, maybe Babylon will come and get these nations next. Well, that should be a, a sign for humility and repentance and calling on the name of the Lord. In verse 12, it says, I will call cause your multitude to fall by the sword of the mighty ones, all of them, most ruthless nations, and they will bring to ruin the pride of Egypt. Sometimes we can correct our own pride by repenting and realizing that we don't, we are not entitled to anything but judgment. And the wonderful thing about Christian Christianity and the Christian faith is that Christ took the judgment for us on the cross. But this, this is not an easy believism thing. We just say that now, now you think everything is good. If Christ is God and gave his all for us, how can we do anything than give our all for him and for his glory? To not do so is to be prideful. So we need to live our lives as a very, very grateful and joyful thanksgiving offering for something we could never earn or deserve or work for. It's grace, but we are greatly grateful for his grace. Look at verse 14. The pride of Egypt was the Nile River. It gave the land its water, and it gave it its vegetation and its crops, and we already saw that the Pharaoh took credit for creating the Nile, and that wasn't a good idea. Um, but verse 14 says, I will make their waters clear, Maybe talk about the clear water of the Nile. They could go swimming in it. Moses floated in it in a little basket. And it gave the nation a lot. But look what's happening. I will cause their rivers to run like oil, declares the Lord God. Well, we know God changed into blood in the days of Moses. But here in the days of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says it's going to be oily. I don't know how many of you maybe remember the wreck of the, um, was it called the Alvarez? I think it was. Was it the Alvarez? It was a, a boat that, um, yeah, it was an oil tanker, and it, it wrecked in the Valdez, I think. And they had video on that of all the different cable channels showing the oil, how it just spread out over the water, and all the birds, and uh, the ducks, and the fish were flipped upside down. It was a disgusting thing. You do not want your river to be like oil. That is a bad thing. It's not, not good for life. And so we see this beginning to happen here in uh, chapter 32, again, the judgment. One of the things that's interesting is you go down to verse 17 of chapter 32. You'll see this phrase again. He's getting another word from the Lord, and he dates it. But for the first time, we get to see what the date refers to. The 12th year, the 5th year, whatever year, the year from what? What, what? what year to? This dates the whole thing. It replies to all these dates in this section on Egypt. In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. 
excuse me, that's not the one I was referring to. I was going to cross-reference it with chapter 33 and verse 21. <laughs> There's another, another um, one. So to turn ahead to a chapter here uh, in verse 21 of chapter 33. And the twelfth year of our exile. That's what he's dating it from. When he talks about the twelfth year, he's talking about the twelfth year since he went into exile there on the Kabar River of uh, Babylon. And I was asking my wife, what are those marks called when you make four marks and then a cross mark on it? And like what, you know, the movies, the prisoners do in jail when they make a little hashtag or a mark. And they said, it's a tally mark, apparently, is what it's called. So when he dates these prophecies by certain activities, they were his tally marks from when he went into exile. Uh, we've already picked up on some of the things here. Let's get on with verse 17. Um, Son of man, verse 18. Wail over the multitude of Egypt. End of verse 18. They're going down to the pit. God does not take death, uh, joy in the death of the wicked. He would rather they repent. Again, his judgment is his strange work. He does not rejoice in um, the calamity of sinners. If he did, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die on a cross to take our sins in his body on the tree. He very much doesn't like sin. It must be judged. He's a just and righteous and true God. But he doesn't take joy in people not repenting. He wants people, even Egypt, to repent. But here's an interesting thing. Have you ever heard this? Uh, you're talking to a not-yet-believer friend or a skeptic or maybe a cynic or maybe somebody that mocks you in the workplace, and they say, well, you think I'm going to hell. You never told them that, but they're feeling that because they're convicted by the Holy Spirit. You think I'm going to go to hell, but I'd rather go to hell and be with my friends because if uh, there's a rock and roll group in hell, it's going to be a great band. We're all going to have a real great time. Well, apparently, uh, Egypt had this kind of mentality towards Ezekiel's prophecy. <laughs> the Pharaoh apparently said something similar. And, um, well, you'll see that as we move through the passage. But in verse 20, it says they're going to die by the sword. In 21, they're going to go to Sheol. And then in verse 22, it starts listing off all the big shots, all the big nations, that have gone to Sheol, the place of the dead, to hell. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm smiling but because of this, this expression. That we're going to have a great time in hell. Hell is not going to be a great time. That's an absurd thing to say. If you read Jesus' descriptions about hell, weeping and gnashing of teeth and darkness and, and pain, it's not a place that you want to entertain. But verse 22, Egypt is told, look, Assyria is already there. Verse 24, look, Elam's already there, and their multitudes are on their grave. In verse 26, Meshach and Tubal are there. In verse 29, Edom is there. The princes of the north, in verse 30, they're all there. The, the Sidon, Sidonians, uh, the people of Tyre, uh, have gone down to the pit. End of verse 30 of chapter 30, 32. Now, here's where I get this part about Pharaoh saying what friends say in your workplace. When Pharaoh sees them, he will be comforted for all his multitude. Pharaoh and all of his army slain by the sword, declares the Lord. For I spread terror in the land of the living, and he shall be laid to rest among the uncircumcised of those who are slain by the sword. Pharaoh and all of his multitude, declares the Lord. So is God saying, uh, Pharaoh, when he finally is judged and he is in hell, he's going to have, have a happy time and be comforted? Now, this is, this is sarcasm, because Pharaoh was saying, when I get there, it's going to be a great time. Uh, but it's not going to be a great time. Uh, he's going to be, quote, comforted. Well, part of it is that, that next verse 23. There's so much terror going on when the whole country of Egypt is burnt and lies desolate for 40 years, that death is going to seem like a relief. It's an interesting paradox. And the unbeliever. For the unbeliever, maybe suffering, going through some, some pain of a prolonged illness or something like this, uh, health, uh, death may seem like a relief, resting in peace, but it's not. 
Beyond this, there's pain unimaginably, separated from every good and perfect gift that comes from the Father above. For the believer, they think, oh, when I die, you know, I'm going to be sleeping or something until the resurrect. No, that's not the way it is. The thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise, Jesus said to him. For us, when we fall asleep or die, it's like there's a hymn that says, it's like uh, stepping on shore and finding it heaven. It's like reaching out for a hand and finding it's God's, like breathing new air and finding it celestial. It's like waking up in glory and finding it home. Heaven is going to be a blast. Going down there is not an option you want to take. And so when we ask for whom the bell tolls, let's remember that, that we want to be on the side of the author of life, the one that died to give us eternal life and make Jesus Lord of every part of our lives with great gratitude and thanksgiving. Now chapter 33 of Ezekiel starts a new section. You'll probably be glad for it because all those chapters about judging Egypt were not very pretty. But chapter 33 actually goes with 34. 34 has to do with Ezekiel prophesying against the shepherds of, of the people of God who were more busy feeding themselves than they were actually caring for God's people. We're not going to look at that chapter tonight, but I just want you to know chapter 33 goes with it. We're going to end with chapter 33 here this evening. And that is really Ezekiel's job as a watchman. And in some ways, your job as a Christian, my job as a Christian is very similar to Ezekiel's. And in some ways, this is a parallel path to chapter 18, where people were saying, oh, we're, our nation's being judged because our parents did something bad, or, oh, I'm being judged because my kids did something bad. Everybody's looking for some kind of a cause to blame other than themselves. It's like when you point the finger at somebody, you got three fingers pointing back at yourself. We've got to be watching out for the sin of pride. And <clears throat> chapter 33 says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people. This is speaking to the Jewish people in exile at the Kabar River in Babylon. If I bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and he blows the trumpet, there's people coming, bad people, and warns the people. Verse 3. Then, if anyone hears the sound of the trumpet, I won't make that sound again, uh, and they don't take warning, they just roll over in bed. I, mean, I add that. They're not taking the warning. And the sword comes and takes him away. His blood will be on his own head. The person heard the warning and didn't do anything about it. So it's his own responsibility. Verse 5, if he heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take the warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. Verse 6, contrast now. But if a watchman sees the sword coming and he doesn't blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and that sword comes and takes away any one of them, that person is taken away in his own iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman hand. Why? Because the watchman saw it coming and didn't warn people. There's a famous magician uh, is on TV. They have a show called Fool Us. And uh, the tallest of the two, you don't know what their names are. Um, anyway. Pen and Teller. Yeah, Pen. Pen Gillette. He's a big, tall guy. and He's an agnostic. He may be an atheist. But he, when he talks about a person trying to witness to him after a show and gave him a little Gideon Bible, he had a lot of respect for this man because the man complimented him on the show and uh, gave eye contact and thanked him for his gifts of entertainment and so forth. But he, he gave him this, this Bible because he wanted him to know Jesus and, and to be able to live uh, forever. And, and Penn Jillette said, hey, if your person really believes that and they don't tell me about it, how much do you have to hate a person to not tell somebody that? Well, Penn Jillette was basically, I don't know if his background was Jewish or not, but he's basically paraphrasing Ezekiel here in 33. If you see calamity coming and you don't tell people and you don't tell them about the author of life, you don't tell them about the salvation in Christ, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable for us. Now, of course, we have the modern story of the, uh, what's it, the little boy that cries wolf? Oh, yeah, people running around saying, oh, we're under judgment for this, or oh, it's calamity for that, oh, we're going to do this, or the economic, and they set dates 
and for Jesus coming, and they said, sell your stuff and go follow us, and, and we're, the end of the world's coming to liquidate your retirement account, don't care for your family. This is nonsense. This is panic peddling. They do not have a word from the Lord. And what happens like the little boy that cried wolf. He cries wolf to see if the people will come out. Well, that was my test. Well, he does it two more times. The people come out, they're irritated. So when a wolf really does come and plunders their sheep, they don't come out because the little boy has been blowing that horn in the middle of the night too many times and he's lost credibility. But that's not part of our text in chapter 33, but it kind of fits with the genre. Verse 8, if I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. I got to tell you, I don't know what blood required at your hand means, but I think I know this much. It means we're accountable to tell people the truth, even if it doesn't make us popular. And don't have to tell them repeatedly like a broken record. We don't have to get in people's faces and be obnoxious. And when we talk about hell, I think it's wise to have a tear in the eye, honestly, because it is a not-so-happy reality. Look at verse 9. But if you warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not turn from his ways, that person will die in their iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? In other words, it's impossible. They realize they're sinners and they're rotting away because of it. But now they're getting into fatalism. Who then can be saved? It reminds you the, the apostles talking to Jesus. And Jesus tells them straight up, with man it is impossible. With God all things are possible. It's called grace. Verse 11. God's response to these people saying, how can, we, how can we then live? And God says, as I live, declares the Lord. He's the living God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Did I say God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Great memory verse here, chapter 11 of 33. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, house of Israel? Then he goes on and talks about the righteous man living by his righteousness, and then he turns to injustice. You don't want to do that. You don't want to end pathetically. And a person that lives unjustly, but then he turns from it and lives righteously. What is this section of Scripture saying through verse 19? Here's what it's saying. It's like the parable of the sower. Some of the seed fell on rocky ground, shallow soil, the leaf comes up quick. Oh, look, we're going to have a wonderful crop. But it doesn't have any root because it's on rocky soil. So it withers away quickly in the sunshine. What's important is not, did you pray a sinner's prayer at a good news club at the age of six? What's important is not, did you, you know, have an emotional experience sometime at, at some revival meeting? What's important is, do you have a living faith in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting him today? And, and you, if you are, you want to finish strong so if persecution comes or COVID comes, or economic collapse comes, or the government goes socialist or communist or we're invaded or whatever fears that you might have, uh, finish strong. Be faithful to Jesus Christ. He is worthy of your full devotion. That's what's important, that we finish strong and we finish the race. We compete according to the rules. Um, verse 20, yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just, O house of Israel. I will judge each of you according to your ways. Your faith is going to show itself in works. Works of thanksgiving, not works of earning it, because you can't earn it. It's insulting to think that you can. But works that are because we love God and we're grateful. No, in verse 21, um, he gets... Uh, a record from a fugitive from Jerusalem that Jerusalem has gone down. This has already happened earlier in the book, but again, he's talking about it here. A man came and talked to him. He was no longer mute, was able to speak the, the word of the Lord to him. The word of the Lord came to me, verse 24, son of man, the inhabitants of the waste places of Israel keep saying, this is what the people in Israel who are not repenting are saying. They're saying, 
Abraham was just one man, but he got possession of the land, but we are many. The land is surely given to us to possess. Can I paraphrase that in modern vernacular? Look, we're never going to be judged because, uh, you know, if there was even one righteous man, he got it, and there's a bunch of us, so we're never going to have any consequences um, because there, there's a lot of us here. But verse 25, Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, You who eat flesh with blood, they're offending God's dietary laws. And this is, has paganism associated. They don't even take time to cook the meat. They're just biting into living things. And you lift up your eyes to idols. They're not worshiping Yahweh. They're worshiping the gods of Egypt that are already going the wrong direction. And you shed blood. That's murder. That's against the Ten Commandments. Shall you possess the land? End of verse 25. You who rely on the sword, living by force, by might makes right. No, might does not make might right. Might just makes you stronger. Sometimes the weaker person is right because they're following God, whether they have physical strength or not. But these people are living and relying by the sword and committing abominations. Each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. This is adultery. This is against the Ten Commandments. You might remember that we talked about the Ten Commandments once before in chapter 22, where all ten are mentioned. This one only mentions four of the Ten Commandments, and then it mentions dietary laws as well. But uh, you don't want to be thinking that there's safety in numbers. Well, if God grades on the curve, I'm getting in, because I'm better than this one or that one. Well, me and my friends, we're doing this, and you know, we got we got a little bit of religion. That uh, doesn't make it. And then, shall you possess the land, um, in verse 25, Shall you possess the land? In verse 26 at the end. Thus say to them, says the Lord God, as I live, as I live, God, the living God, those who are in the waste places shall fall by the sword. Whoever is in the open field will be given to the beast. And those that are protected, they think, in the strongholds are going to die by the pestilence. I will make the land desolate, and her proud shall come to an end. And I mentioned that it doesn't make any difference what kind of a special diet you have or how good you are at keeping the commandments on the outside for people to see and the applause of men and so forth. If you've got this pride thing going on inside, you've got an issue. The pride is going to bring down and the mountains of Israel will be desolate and done to pass through. Then they will know, verse 29, that I am the Lord when I have made the land desolate and waste because of their abominations. Now the chapter ends with this interesting thing. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not. People will sometimes say, when they go to a Christian concert or something like that, and they hear a song about giving it all to God, and they go, man, I really like that song. I like that rhythm. I like that, that bass laid down a nice groove, and that drummer, you hear that syncopated thing he's going on. But the point is the words asking us to turn to God. But instead, we're all distracted by the entertainment. And people can be this way with their favorite preacher. Well, he speaks so good. He's so eloquent. Oh, he's got good illustrations. Um, you know, it, it's not about the speaker. It's about what the Word of God has to say and whether or not we're listening to it. Look what God tells Ezekiel about how people are speaking about him behind their back. It says, For you, O son of man, your people talk together about you in the walls by the walls and at the doors of the houses. And they say to one another, Come, let's go hear what the word of is from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. With lustful talk in their mouths, they act, their heart is set again on getting gain. They're into money. Jesus said it. You can't serve God and mammon. They're just into getting stuff. But they like hearing you preach. Oh yeah, you get fired. It's very entertaining. Verse 32. And behold, you are to them as one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. Oh, for they will hear what you say, but they won't do it. Tragic. When this comes, and come it will. God's prophecies hold true. 
when it comes, not if it comes, when it comes, and come it will, it's sure, they will know that a prophet has been among them. I like the cross-reference here just at the end of James because I think the point of this section is don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of it. Think about ways to obey it. Think about ways to apply it in encouraging somebody on a phone call or if you're on Zoom calls or if you're visiting people or even if you're just dropping off things at their doors or something like that. How can you be a doer of the word of God? And James, the half-brother of Jesus, talks about this concept in uh, chapter 1 of James, starting with verse 18. And I'll just read down to verse 25, and then we'll close with prayer. But James also, very concerned about not just being a hearer of the word, not just being entertained by, oh, look how that prophecy came true, oh, look at that repeating word or phrase, but being a doer of it, repenting of pride, and uh, seeking ways to honor and to worship Jesus, and to draw others to do the same. James 1, 18. Of his own will, speaking of God, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Know this, my beloved brother, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, and then he goes away and forgets what he was like. Doesn't comb his hair, doesn't get the piece of spinach out between his teeth. Um, uh, He's a mess. He forgets about it. Uh, but verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. See, this is not about earning something. It's the law of liberty and, and perseveres. Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Um, that's where I'm going to close this off here tonight. We will be doers of the word of God. Certainly Ezekiel was. Certainly we have times when we are and times when we are better than others, but these passages remind us that uh, we're not the only one that thinks we live in perilous times, and we're not the only one that deals with uh, hypocrisy, and we're not the only ones that deal with thinking that we're better than other people and having to wrestle with spiritual pride and, and need to repent. So let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you so much for being on the Sunday night service tonight. I'm sorry for the hiccup in the video, and it has to come to you in two parts. The first part with the music and the Christmas carols and the last part finishing through chapter 33. But thank you for enduring with us this evening and I hope this loops and you can watch it and share it with others. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christmas where it's so easy to speak of you becoming a man. When it's so easy to sing Christmas carols. When it's so easy to say Merry Christmas. And somebody from a different faith may wish us happy holidays, and they don't mean anything by it, Lord. Well, we, can, we can wish them a Merry Christmas, and, and we, we don't know what their traditions are. But we know that we can speak of Jesus, because his uh, nativity scenes are all over the place. The Christmas carols are full of his praise, and he is the center of history. And we thank you that Jesus, who was born of a baby, uh, born of a virgin, as a baby in an animal feeder who escaped Israel, who was called, escaped to Egypt and was called out of Egypt, uh, is our crucified Savior. He's our Lord. He's our master teacher. And we thank you. He is our risen Savior. He conquered death. Not a seasonal thing like the fertility gods and goddesses, but once and for all dying for our sin. Once and for all conquering death and is ascended and seated at the right hand of God the Father, the living God. We pray, Lord, that we would have joy in making you known at this time because we know the days are short. And the scripture tells us that we shouldn't forsake the gathering together. We don't know what that means, Lord. You said well, two or three are gathered in your name. You're right there in the midst. So help us to find a lot of twos and threes and conference calls and praying with people over the phone and, and sharing you with, with people in the in the realms that you give us access. And Lord, where 
things may require us to break your law, help us to be courageous and uh, winsome in carrying on for your glory and obeying your word as doers of the word, regardless of which way the world goes. We know we live in a time with a lot of fear. So, Lord, we do pray that we would be wise as serpents, as gentle as doves, and with the word of God on our lips and encouragement that people might turn. And if they tell us about something they did uh, 20 years ago, but they're living like the devil, now help us to encourage them to finish strong and to get back on track with you and to know the joy of the Lord. And Father, where there's been pride in our lives and any kind of spiritual pride and thinking we're better than this one or that one, or imagining things about other people's motivations, convict us quickly by your Holy Spirit. Pride just took down so many people, King of Babylon, King of Tyre, the Egyptian Pharaoh, and it, it's a choker. It's really, uh, you'll be like gods, Satan said to Adam and Eve in the garden. Lord, we, we want to be humble servants. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for leading us to yourself. And if anyone is in the, the sound of this voice tonight and they don't know you personally, I pray that they would just uh, do these uh, four R's, not as a work, but as a reality check. The R's repent, turn. That's what repent means. Just turn from trusting yourself and say, I can't trust myself. <laughs> I can't trust what I'm thinking and speaking. I, I need to turn to God. I need to learn of Jesus. Turn, repent. That's the first R, repent and then to rely on what Jesus did on the cross for them. He lived the perfect life. He has the righteousness. He has the forgiveness. He has the power over the resurrection to rely on his finished work. And then to receive him. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you sent at Pentecost. Thank you that you send your spirit to repentant people who ask you for help. Come and give us that new heart that you speak of in Ezekiel 36 a new spirit that you put in us. Lord God, help them to receive. Repent, rely, and receive the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, to resolve to follow you in every part of their lives. Workplace, religious place, family place, health care, political speech, lustful singing and lustful speech. Just take it away, Lord, and help us to glorify you with our tongues in our day. And we thank you that you're able to do these things because you're drawing people to yourself. And we thank you for the opportunity to speak your truth tonight. And by the way, if anybody has uh, uh, prayed that prayer and you've asked God to help you turn and to rely and to receive and to resolve, give me a jingle. I'm 765-532-4882 or send a text message. I'd love to give you some follow-up materials. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would fill us afresh with your spirit as we go into this Christmas week, interacting with family. Help us to be signposts of your kingdom, winsome witnesses to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us this evening. Normally, this service starts at 6 and gets done at uh, 7.30. We got done a little bit early. I hope that this is a blessing to you and you can pass it along to others. God bless you. Have a good night.